Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 52 with a man of many talents, journalist, musician, producer, commentator, founder, Sal Masekela. This episode was brought to you by Olakai, a company who puts a ton of time and thought into crafting amazing footwear for men and women. I have a ton of pairs of Olakai sandals and even some of their slip-ons, and I love their shoes because they're all made really well so they don't break down. And they're all stylish, so you can wear them with really nice outfits and always to the beach. Olakai was founded to celebrate the aloha spirit and the waterman lifestyle, and they also aim to do a lot of good. They believe that sustainability and positive living is less about an ethos and more about the choices and actions you make every day. One of the best parts is this company is a certified B Corporation, and they do a ton of giving back to communities. They even have their own Ama Olukai Foundation, a nonprofit that helps to preserve the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian spirit, which I'm a big fan of considering my grandma lived in the islands. You can check them out and buy an awesome pair of sandals or even some slip-ons or one of their new pairs of boots for yourself or a loved one this season at olukai.com. That's O-L-U-K-A-I, olukai.com. This episode was brought to you by Active Skin Repair. They're a non-toxic, multifunctional skin and wound repair solution that replaces products like Neosporin, tea tree oil, and even hydrogen peroxide all in one solution so you can take less stuff with you on surf trips and adventures. I found this product created by a bunch of biotech guys who also love the outdoors. The active ingredient, hypochlorous or HOCL, is naturally produced by white blood cells to kill 99% of bacteria within 15 seconds. It also reduces skin inflammation and helps the body heal naturally. The best part is it does it without harsh chemicals or antibiotics. You can use it on sensitive parts, and it's even reef safe and environmentally friendly. The medical team for the World Surf League is using it for reef cuts. Rock climbers are using it for flappers, cyclists for chafing and saddle sores, and even Navy SEALs are carrying it in their pack. To heal faster and go farther, check them out at bldgactive.com. That's bldgactive.com. If you've ever watched action sports on TV, chances are you've heard this guy before. Salema or Sal Masakela is often the man commentating and behind the mic of these events. Sal hosted the X Games for 13 years, Vice World of Sports, he hosted E's Daily 10, the FIFA World Cup when it was in South Africa, and today he hosts NBC's Red Bull Signature Series, and he's even doing stuff with National Geographic. He's a producer, musician, philanthropist, and so much more. We talk about being an outsider and fitting in, his relationship with his dad, who's South African jazz icon, Hugh Masekela, music, surfing, how you can pursue your passions, and so much more. This guy's kind of a legend in my world, and I've always looked up to his career. It's a longer episode, but Sal's a storyteller for a living, and it is so good. Enjoy this show. All right, so we're at Sal Masakela's house. Sal, thank you for coming on to Wild Ideas Worth Living and having me here. It's awesome. Thank you for having me. I've heard nothing but glowing reviews about you and your podcast, so... Awesome. I want to bottle that. I should Um, get her here. So you've told stories in action sports and been kind of the face of action sports forever. I'd love to hear a personal moment, something meaningful in action sports. And I don't know if it's like Kelly took you out and scared you because he does that to a lot of people or maybe just surfing growing up as a kid or skateboard story or snowboard story. I know you do it all. Shit. I mean, I have, I have so many stories. I think probably the, the one of the, my favorite stories is how I first discovered surfing. I was 15 years old. I was on tour with my father on the Graceland tour with Paul Simon. 
um, which is a big music tour, big album. And my father took me out of school for three and a half months to go on a road with he and Paul Simon to Australia and through the States to go, uh, to go on this music tour. And, you know, it, it was probably not the most popular idea to pull your kid out of school for three and a half months in sophomore year of high school. But um, fortunately, my mom was able to convince the school to let me out. And long story short, I went to Australia for the first time. And it was incredible. And we had a day off. We were in Sydney and I, I, I kind of had the run of the city. I, I, they treated me like an adult. So I'd go wherever I wanted and I always had money in my pocket and I would go exploring. And I went and took a ferry um, in Sydney to this little small island and a beach. And I was watching the surf and these two kids who were about my age come running out. It looked like it was probably like in the late afternoon when kids get off of school and they, they paddled out and I'd never seen surfing before. That's awesome. And I proceeded to, to sit there eating this sandwich, watching these kids, which for me at the time I, I was witnessing break dancing on water. I just was like, Holy shit. These kids are, they're literally dancing on water. And, you could see the flair and the self-expression in how they perform these maneuvers and they were hooting each other on. And it, it was the closest thing I could think of was b-boying because I was the type of time I had, I had grown up a b-boy and I was like, I'm going to do that one day. Like it just struck me. I was like, I don't know how, I don't know where, but I'm going to do that one day. And a year later, my mother and stepfather I came home from school one day and they sat me down and they told me that we were moving to a place called Carlsbad in 1988. I didn't know what that meant. I knew that California was a thing. I'd been to California as a kid. I had no reference other than to look it up in an encyclopedia and I saw a picture, not of the beach, but of a motocross track that was there at the time. And that was a long time ago. Yeah. And then literally, you know, two weeks later, I was waking up to walk outside to go and unload um, our U-Haul with my stepdad. And we were on a hill and you just look out to the West and there she is 100% in her magic, all of the Pacific ocean. And it just so turned out that this place where we landed happened to be the place, you know, my first day of school, all the kids, that I, I I mean, they all looked like like Martians. They were dressed weird and they had funny hair and they were wearing sandals at school and shorts and tank tops blazoned with weird logos. And they spoke in a strange language and said, dude, and brah, and all this shit. And I didn't know where I was, but it just so happened to be that this was the place where that shit that blew my mind the year earlier, that's where it, it lived. And... I met a kid on my second day of school there who took an interest in me. I was the only black kid in my grade. There was a school of like 2,700 and there was three kids of color. And I was one of them, um, which was interesting. And kids were curious about me because I was from the East Coast and I'd grown up in New York. And it was almost like I had come down from, from space or some shit. <laughs> um, but a week after getting there, this kid invited me to his house and I... My parents let me go and they set me up with a board and wetsuit. I came out. Um, they were all, him and all his friends were waiting for me in uh, the driveway. And I was in the bathroom putting on the wetsuit and I came out and everyone just fell out laughing, like on the ground, unable to breathe. And I was like, what's so funny? And I had, because anything that I'd ever put on with a zipper had zipped up the front, I'd put on oh, yeah, the you wetsuit, put your wetsuit on wrong. backwards. <laughs> and, um, but anyway... That's my. That's how I I fell in love with surfing. It was so weird, and that that day I stood up in the white water for like maybe ten seconds, and that ten seconds felt like ten minutes, and it was spiritual. It was like a time stop. Heavens opened up. I got filled with something, some sort of spirit, and the entire direction of my life uh, changed that day. I just knew I was never going to stop doing it. 
I didn't know how that was going to inform my life, but it was the first thing ever that I was like, I'm going to do this for as long as I'm alive. And then I heard in the Red Bull podcast, you would surf like 175 days. Yeah. I, time. I had, I had to play catch up because all the kids there had been surfing forever. So I accounted, it was around the first year at a certain point, I surfed somewhere in the area, like 175, 180 days in a row, like rain or shine. I was out every day by myself and it could be six inches or six feet. So I was either sitting out there doing nothing or I was getting killed, but I was out there. So I want to talk about this time in your life where a lot of the listeners are younger than me. They, there was no YouTube. There was no internet. No. What was that like learning to surf in this time? It was amazing because you got up and you went and checked the ocean every day. People talked about whether there may or may not be swell coming. Um, your friend, maybe his parents let him call Surfline. And at the time you called Surfline yep. on something called the 976 surf number, which they would give you the forecast, but it costs you like, I don't know, 50 cents, maybe 75 cents every time you called. And um, even then, the forecasting was pretty spotty. Most of us, your, your parents, would they saw if they saw the phone bill, they'd be like, "What is this?" Because it didn't say surf; it just said nine seven six. Also, for the young listeners, most nine seven six numbers were associated with pornographic um, phone lines. And so, I remember the first time that I, <laughs> my my, I, I didn't realize that it cost money, and I called like maybe twenty five, thirty times. My parents are looking at the phone bill, like, "What is this?" I'm like, no, it's a, it's a surf line thing. And then they blocked surf line. So I wasn't able to call. Oh, bummer. So that was one of the things you did. You, you went to the beach every day and you checked the surf, you know, and if it was good, you were out there. And a lot of times you'd get surprised by a swell and if someone's calling, like, it's pumping. Like, what do you mean? It's like six foot, per-. you know, and you dropped everything and, and you went. There wasn't this convenience. If someone, you waited for movies to come out, you went to, go and see premieres. And then you hope that someone's parents would, would buy the movie. And then you'd all sit around and you'd watch that tape until on a VHS, you'd, you'd, you'd watch it until it didn't work anymore. And if surfing came on, you know, it, it came on like a public access channel type show and it was footage from a contest that was maybe a year or two old, but you were just so hyped that you were watching surfing on television that it didn't matter. So we were, we were our own... YouTube, we were our own focus group. You know, you read things in the magazine, you saw pictures, you'd hope that you saw like some video evidence of it when films came out. But, you know, you, you, there was, I remember when in Surfer Magazine, as you would come out, they would have like a, a, a graphic of the tour and it was like a, like a track, like a circular track oval and it would have all the stops. And that's how you knew what happened. And it'd be like a brief overview of what, what happened in a contest last month. And that's where the world title was. You didn't find out who won the world title until maybe a month later, unless you had a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who maybe was there. It was crazy, but it was a special time. And because of that, you were adventurous, you know, you, you packed up in the cars and you drove places to these waves that you wanted to, to, to see that you'd heard about or you saw pictures of but you didn't have any context of what was going to be like. So you'd go to Blacks, you know, and you'd go to Mexico, and you'd, 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 you'd go, uh, you know, into to Central Cal and, and, and go on surf adventures. And it was, a, you, didn't, you didn't share what you did on the gram. You just talked about it for forever with your friends. And it was, a, yeah, it was a different, it was a different deal. You could never, you couldn't pretend that you lived this life. There was no way for you to identify with the culture if you didn't live it. Even if you were dressed the part, you would quickly be exposed to someone who didn't live it. So you didn't dare like wear vans if you didn't skate or or dress, you know. You in we always would joke that you knew if someone was from inland California <laughs> as opposed to the coast because their logos of the shirts that the Billowongs and the Quicksilver sold usually had their logos on the back and logos on the front were reserved for coastal stores, 
which is crazy, I'm sure, for people to hear now. But that's how you knew who the kooks were. So storytelling, you you would talk stories on these adventures and sometimes you'd get stunk, but ultimately you've become a storyteller. And I love your career so much because I've tried to do a lot of what you've done with your career, obviously not at all tier level, but surfing captivated me early on. And I tried to get any job I could that let me surf and tell stories around that. And somehow you've gone from surfer to Transworld intern to ESPN, X Games, the face of X Games, really, Ease Daily 10, which is totally different, but then to Vice World of Sports, Red Bull, the Olympics, you're a music producer, you write your music, you're sing, you sing your own songs, um, and, and now you're doing stuff with National Geographic Explorer. How do you transcend one all these genres? This is a big question, but really like, were you ever pitching and asking to do more or was there some luck involved? Like you've had all these wild ideas. So did people just choose you? How have you taken every wild idea and actually made it happen? Maybe we can start with the first one. Well, I've never fit in. I've never fit in. I've never been like the person who fits in a box of like, Oh, he's this. So he should be that. Um, I've always had to sort of break my way in a, almost anything. And it really action sports was one of those things. I didn't look like anybody else um, within my circle of friends. And there was always this idea, like any, anything that was, anything that was marketed to me about surfing and snowboarding, especially was, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed white kids for the most part. So I was used to going to parties and stuff and with my friends and they'd be talking surfing and then suddenly I'm talking and I'm speaking knowledgeably and people would be like, wait a minute, you surf? That's crazy. Well, why is it crazy? Well, because you're black. And that was just it's so crazy. normal and regular. So I think... That's one of the best things that happened to me, I think, growing up in Carlsbad was I was always the odd man out. I was I was always used to sort of having to almost convince people that I belonged wherever it was that I was, whether it was getting jobs or making friends or dating, all of it. Like I had to I had to work a little harder. So in turn, I would I I tried like regular routes, right? Like I, I went to junior college for a little while. I got a job at Bank of America as a teller. Then I was like, okay, well, what can I do that'll give me enough money so that I can live? So like a construction seems cool. All my construction friends have like nice trucks and always have surfboards. That turned out that you had to be there at six. Then it was janitor, like office cleaning, cleaning windows. So you uh, did that? You I were did that. A janitor. Oh, I was a janitor for years. I would literally work until the morning and I would surf all day or till noon or whatever. And I'd sleep a little bit in the day and then I'd work again at night. That was amazing for the lifestyle, but socially left me like out. Girls were like, wait, what? You do what? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not really trying to fuck with you. Um, then I was working at, <laughs> then I got, I was working at the Belly Up Tavern as a, in Solano Beach as a bouncer and a uh, bar back and then bussing tables part-time at the Potato Shack in Encinitas on Saturdays and Sundays because you'd make a hell amount of cash there. And that's when um, one day a bunch of people came to the, this, uh, came to the, to the restaurant and they all were, they, they all had um, ASR trade show badges on and they said Transworld on them. And I remember walking by the table and they were all about my age and they looked, but they looked cool and they had all the gear on and they had these badges with their names on them and they said Transworld and said the trade show. So I walked up to my friend who was a volleyball player uh, and I said, dude, you gotta give me that table. He's like, I'm not giving you that table. That's a huge table. Like I'm styling them out, you know, cause we always, my thing was like, I'm the busser, but the more that you can do to stoke them out, they're going to usually tip you out on the side. And they, uh, 
I, I gave him five bucks and gave me the table. And that table turned out to be Chad Denena. It's the guy who started Nixon Watches. Yeah. Who at the time was a junior ad sales rep at Transworld. And we're talking and I'm taking care of them, whatever, getting them, you know, free orange juice and coffee refills and just talking shit. And they started coming in on a regular basis and they were so cool. I was like, I can't believe I'm asking them 10,000 questions about what's it like to work at Transworld. Blah, 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 blah. Finally, like maybe the third or fourth time that Chad had come in, he just looked at me and, and he said, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? What are you doing? Like, what are you doing with your life? Like you're outgoing, you surf, you snowboard, you skateboard, like, you have this incredible personality. Like, what do you want to do? And I said, I just want to keep a, being able to kind of live and try to shred as much as possible. I'm not really overthinking it. He's like, well, that sometimes, sometimes that's going to run out. Don't you think? And he gave me his card and he said, um, we're hiring a junior sales, uh, ad sales rep under me. He's like, I think I could like, I could get you in there and we, you know, you could work for me. I was like, get out of here. He gives me his card. He's like, call me tomorrow. My dumb ass takes his card, goes back. At the time, I was, I, I was no longer in the studio. I lived with like four other guys in a place. And I told him the story. Like, this dude from Transworld. Like, that's amazing. Call him. I didn't call him for like two or three days because I was literally scared. And then I finally called him. He was like, you blew it. Like, I told you to call me two days ago. Like, we hired someone. Like, you blew it. And... um there went that. And then two or three days later, he called me again. Mind you, I was up for a junior ad sales position. He said, our receptionist just decided that she's going to go full load at college. And um, they're looking for somebody. Like, I can't make any guarantees. But if you come in here and you prove that you want to be here and put your head down and try and help everyone in every department, maybe you can get someplace else. So instead of sliding into the coolest job, I slided into like the grunt job, but there was something about everything that I had done beforehand in all these different jobs and, and, and knowing how to deal with people and being comfortable with just about anyone that the receptionist job actually ended up being exactly where I needed to be. And being able to also have that kind of intern vibe where I would go to editorial, I would go to advertising, I would go to the publishing side, I would go to operations, I would go to everyone and be like, what can I do for you? And that's really uh, how my career took off. And it, and, it, and it was the place where it was also the time. We were talking 1993 or four. Action sports is still 100% made up of its active users. And then that small extra bit that wants to buy products associated with it so that they can identify with this culture. And no companies are public, really. No, None. no, 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 no companies are public mm -mm. At, at all. That's not even a thing. And they're all companies that are started by people who just saw a void and started these brands and learned on the go. So it's also that style that style of like, well, I can do this myself is, is sort of the, the driving theme of the industry. So when you have all these crazy examples of, of, of people that you watch that are making, literally making history and making, shaping the sports um, in real time, it was very easy to, to, to be aspirational and, and be like, well, I want to I want to do more. I want to, I, I want to do whatever. But my very first thing I realized after the first week is like, I found my people. I'm not going to get fired because the waves were really good. And I surfed a, a little bit late. In fact, I'm going to get high five for it. And if I work really, really hard four days and we all decide to go snowboarding early on Friday, everyone, including the CEO is going to be down for that. I, that was a foreign concept for me. I think what's interesting you touched on and for people listening, because everybody listening to the show wants to follow their passions and make a living at it. And what you said was you paid your dues, you went in, you, you got the job, but you asked everyone, how can I help you? And you helped them. Oh yeah. I stuffed envelopes. I, 
did whatever it was. And I never expected anything in return. I just did it. And then you volunteered one time to host something like was it Board Aid? It was Board Aid, yeah. They, um, Board Aid was this, this, this benefit where it was like a snowboard contest and they build a half pipe and have these great music acts come and perform all to raise money for awareness of, of AIDS and HIV amongst the youth population. And so Transworld had this ambitious thing that they were going to host this thing. And they had partnered with um, this uh, music organization in New York. And this was cool. This was avant-garde, you know, culture cl- mixing. To, the Warp to, Tour came out of yeah, Board Aid. Was, was totally born out of it. But they didn't have an MC. And I was overhearing uh, Louise Balma, who, and she was like, shit, we don't have an MC. Like, what are we, who's going to announce the bands? And, ah! and I just walked up to her. And I literally overheard her at the front desk. I was like, I think I could do it. And she looked at me almost like annoyed. And she remembered that I had volunteered to like MC a karaoke thing at the Transworld snowboarding retreat, which I somehow snuck into. I don't even know. I was a receptionist and I knew that was a place I needed to be. And I ended up in like Jackson Hole, Wyoming when I like as an intern, essentially. And um, she's like, yeah, well, I guess you, you do have the personality to do this. She's like, okay, well, you can't blow it. Um, I said, like, you don't have to pay me. I'll do it. And um, I'll never forget that morning. It was like a Saturday morning. You don't know how many good people are going to be there. Uh, Jane's Addiction was playing. You know, Tony Hawk and everyone was there. It was going to be at the vert ramp. Like they had called the finest, the best of the best from everywhere. For this event and I just got up in the morning I got up I, I, I got up on stage at like 9.30 in the morning for this essentially like futuristic action sports music festival and I just was like good morning Snow Summit it felt like the most natural thing I'd ever done in my life and then I just started talking shit and didn't stop for like 12 hours and by the time it was over everyone was like you killed it that was the greatest thing ever and that's how it began. People started calling for like demos, skate demos at shops or little snowboard contests or surf contests. Like, hey, man, we'll give you some store credit or lift tickets if you come and MC our event. And that would start to lead to more and more where someone was doing an event in another. I remember the first time that someone called me from Colorado and they were like, hey, everyone says that you kill it on the mic. Will you come and do our contest? Like, we'll fly you here. And we'll put you up and you'll give you lift tickets. I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'll be there in a second. And it was my side hustle. My side hustle that also I had access. I had access. I was on the phones when I started off as, a, as obviously, like I, like I said, as a receptionist, but then I moved into product sales. So I'd be on the phone. My job in product sales meant that I called every single shop in the country to sell them magazines or Transworld swag. You had to be able to like break the ice and have this person who was obviously busy trying to run their mom and pop shop. You had to engage them. So my thing was information. Hey, Terry Hawkinson was just in the building uh, yesterday with uh, John Foster. And like, there's a shoot going on. Oh, no way. Really? Tell me more. You know, or hey, you know, just telling Ox was just here or, or, you know, Tony Hawk or, I could tell them things that were going on, you know, because we were in the hub. So I had information. And in turn, they would give me information on what's going on. And I'd be like, well, this is the brand that you should be picking up. Joyride Snowboards that my friend started, that's hot. You should pick it up. They would call, they would call into me for ad, uh, advice about brands, et cetera. And then it'd be like, oh, we're doing a, uh, an event at such and such. You think you'd come announce it? And I'd say to Transworld, like, kind of makes sense if I go there, don't you think? So it was like a it was like a weird hustle that would in turn end up growing into more because it just was would just so happen that in the mid nineties someone on Madison Avenue said these sports are generating all sorts of cash. This is a this is a unique population of kids that dress a certain way, that live a certain way, that listen to a certain type of music. Let's build brands and figure out a way to cater to them. X Games would be born, and a couple of years in the X Games, they realized we don't have 
voices from the culture. They were using stick and ball people. And luckily, when they called Transworld and said, who do we get? They said, yeah, I get this guy. So how did you eventually get paid to do what you love? Like you did it for free a lot and then for, for lift a tickets. long time. And just so you know, last week I spoke to the Girl Scouts and they were like, hey, we can't pay you a speaking fee, but we have free ice cream. And I was like, <laughs> it was like the best pitch. I did it. You know, how do, how do people eventually get paid to do these things? And also, I really want to go back. Like performance, storytelling, it's in your blood. Your dad was a performer. Do you do voice exercises? Like how do you have such a good voice? I don't do voice exercises. You don't go like, ee, you know, I don't like I do it. voice exercises for singing. Mm -hmm. I do take this, I make throat, I've been making throat coat tea, which you can get at Whole Foods or any decent market that has a couple of healthy items in it. Been drinking that for probably 15 years. Um, now I take this spray called Singers that actually Chris Cote turned me on to. Oh. He's like, bro, have you fucking heard of Singers? It's amazing. I was like, no. Um, He's great. He's been on the show. But I, I think, how did I get paid? My friends actually had to have an intervention with me because I was the guy that every company would call to come and do their Christmas party or announce a contest or what have you. And I would just be happy with getting a little bit of product. Um, and I was fine with it. And people took advantage of me. And when I say advantage, like CEOs of some of the biggest companies in this deal. And it was literally a couple of my friends who were like, hey, that's money. And I'd be like, no, like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't like have these opportunities. Like I had just started doing some stuff at MTV and, and I had a show on Fox Sports called Board Wild that was like a action sports lifestyle show. This is all pre-ESPN. Well, that was the first time people gave me a little bit of money, like $250 for a show or $500. It's like, what? 500 bucks? Yeah, I'll come shoot with you. No problem. Um, and it was finally a couple of friends who were like, you're being taken advantage of. It's time for you to get paid. So I remember the first time someone called and they're like, so we can expect you to come out and be the thing. Like, yeah, how much? And they were Borderline offended. Like, what do you mean, bro? And I was like, I can't live off of bro. Like, we're friends, but if you you you, you got you got to pay me. Once I got over that, then it was easy, and people were sort of happy um, to do it. So, is it hard for you to ask for money, like like to get paid, like for what you're worth? I, it's something that I've gotten a lot better at, but I was not very. I was horrible at it. In the beginning. Is there any tips you can give to people on like how to get better at asking for what you're worth? Um, have a conversation with yourself first. Um, know what your worth is and always ask for more than you deserve because that's the only way you're ever going to get paid what you deserve. If you expect that people are going to be like, oh, hey, like, so you do this and, da, 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 and I'm going to that they're going to like say the magic number that's in your head. You're out of your mind. The only interest that people have is in their bottom line. They don't know your life. They don't know what your struggles are. They don't know the work you've put into what you have to give. They I honestly don't know your value. I don't think even a lot of times that people have bad intentions. They're just too busy thinking about their own shit to understand the value of what you have to give. So you need to hold it up for them. They need to see it in the same way that they see a price tag on anything else that they buy or consume for their businesses or in their personal life. And it's that simple. When you start to think of yourself and what you do as a product, the whole like, I'm not comfortable asking people for money thing goes out of the way, especially when you start being able to like pay your rent and take care of your family based off of a talent that you've worked very hard uh, to share with others. That's really good advice. Thank you. And it was a selfish question, but I appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of people listening to this show who have these side hustles and, you know, they tell stories for a living and they want to make more money. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk about music because mm. it's such a big part of your life. Music and surfing, how, what do they do for you viscerally? Like, and the, how do they go hand in hand? They're so beautiful 
in the manner in which they go hand in hand. I mean, when I close my eyes and I think of the first surf videos that I saw, I can think about the surfing and then I can think about the music that was played during someone's part. Um, surfing in and of itself is a very, like I mentioned earlier, it's a dance. Skateboarding is a dance. Snowboarding, it's a dance. They are a musical. They are the most artistic forms of athletic expression that I think exist. And they're very rhythmic and they're very musical. So it makes sense that people work so hard to pick a song for their part, right? It's because it has to complement what's happening on the screen. Should be able to tell the story. And so that was one of my favorite things when I first got into these sports was like, oh, not only does it come with this amazing life, but there's all this music. Like there's all this music that people listen to. I mean, I discovered everything that I'd ever know about alternative music or punk rock music came from my discovery of surfing and skateboarding and snowboarding. And I think as a person who grew up with music, I mean, before I moved to the West Coast, my life was, was surrounded in the arts. My father's a jazz musician, a trumpet player, a flugelhorn player, and a singer, and an incredible activist who was a political exile of South Africa during apartheid. And my earliest memories with my father are being at the club with him at like five, six years of age. Um, five or six years of age um, on a Friday or Saturday night in jazz clubs. You know, that's, that's my earliest relationship texture to my father, not like playing baseball or, you know, something like that. But it's like being in jazz clubs. So music has always been very dear to me. I grew up in the New York public school system where, you know, at seven, eight years old, they put you in a room with a bunch of instruments mm. and they, they tell all the kids like, go. go on. And everyone runs to the pile and you're expecting him like, whoa, look at this one. What does this one do? And then you find one that speaks to you or maybe like you were too slow to get to the one you want. So you had to pick the next one. And then they put you in a room and they start teaching you music. So I started playing clarinet when I was seven or eight. I was singing in the choir at the same age. And, you know, that I moved on to, to and I was doing theater at the same time. And then I started playing saxophone when I was 10 years old. And so I'd always played um, an instrument or sang in the school choirs up and through my teen years. And then when I got to Cali, like, I was actually kind of depressed because, like, it wasn't cool here. It wasn't cool to be in the school band. In fact, all they had was a marching band. And I was like, there's no way you're putting me in that polyester bullshit. So it just kind of music took a uh, a, a backseat at, at that point. But... Surfing became my music. It became the same, the same ability to like string together notes and write songs essentially on a wave. I mean, that's what people, it's what you're doing. You're looking at this canvas and you're fucking making notes and you're in rhythms. And that's, that's the beauty of all of watching all these things is these little signatures that people have much the way that anyone who sings or plays music does. One of the things I think is so interesting is I know a lot of people whose dads especially did great things, won Nobel Prizes, and usually a kid, it, it's really hard to live up to their dad or they, they've lived in the dad's shadows. And it seems like you've done so much with your career. And I guess I'm curious, you know, did you ever resist music because your dad, just the way that kids resist snowboarding because their dad snowboards and they're like, it's not cool. Yeah. I'm going to ski. Or did you just always have this bond with your, your dad music? I had went through horrible times with my dad, especially at around like 1920. My father was also an addict and he was struggling. And what drove his addiction was also like being homeless for 30 years, being a man without a country for 30 years, being a man whose family was ripped apart by a legalized racist governing system and trying to figure out how to like be in this world without taking citizenship in another country, you know, whilst having like his heart ripped out every day that he wasn't able to see his family. 
those were things I didn't comprehend at 19. And so at the lowest of my father's struggles, it was easy for me to make it about me. In a lot of ways, it was about me because he by default would let me down. And so at a certain point, I just, I turned my back on the idea of trying to be like him, which was actually ended up being the greatest gift ever because it was really hard during the brief periods in my, I would say my junior year, high school years, in the early high school where I showed actual musical promise, all my music teachers wanted to be the ones to say like that they were teaching Hugh Masekela's son. And so that came with a whole different set of problems and expectations that my father's a fucking prodigy, like a one of one. There was never any way that I was going to ever live up to that. And so in a strange way, being able to get out of a place that where I was going to have to go head to head with like what my career in the arts was because I was in a place that that's where, that's what New York was. And moving to a place like Cali where no one cared, no one knew who my father was. You know, maybe like your parents knew or your parents would hear the name and someone would be like, you know, my dad said that like, there's a guy <laughs> who's like a Masekela guy and like he listened to in the sixties. Like, is that your dad? Is that, you know, that guy is? And I could be like, yeah, that's, that's my dad. It wasn't going to be a conversation past that unless I met their parents. So I got to exist for the most, and those parents had to be like cool and super hip. So I got to exist in total anonymity from how, of whatever that shadow was. So finding surfing, finding snowboarding, finding skateboarding, and then being able to find this path, you know, through that job at Transworld, and my name not making any difference or having any bearing allowed me to just like focus on this thing that I loved that made me just me, Sal, Salema Masakela, but Sal Masakela when I was the, the nickname I got when I got to Cali because Salema was too hard for people. Um, and that's, that's really why I think I was able to, to flourish in it. I didn't have any, I had no, no pressure. It was mine. But recently you've, you've, you've started to play music. I mean, I heard this with your dad, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. So what's that been like to come full circle and now play music with your father? It's, it's pretty amazing. I always had the itch, you know, like I always, I, I always, I've always been a, ma a massive music fan. And when I moved to Los Angeles, my cousin and I built a studio um, at our first place in the early 2000s. So I was, I, was, um, I was making music, but I was making music quietly. I was singing on Friends Records and it was just my fun side hustle. And people knew that if they put a few drinks in me that I would also, I think, had a reputation as being like the karaoke guy within, uh, it, within the skate and surf and snow worlds, which is really funny. You'd be at a contest, you'd be at a bar and people like, Oh, Sal's got to sing. Um, and some good things came out of that. I, I have to say there were some plenty of good nights that came out of that, <laughs> but, um, you can only imagine the idea of like making music as a Masekela, um, was foreign. And but, there's probably some pressure from South Africa. Like, Oh yeah. There's all sorts of pressure. All I sorts mean. of things. I mean, as, as also too, like as obviously as people got to know me and, and my name got out there, people started to connect like, wait a minute, that Masekela is related to that Masekela? How did that Masekela become like the only dark face in this crazy, like exploding, weird subculture? Like how did, how do you go from political exile, trumpet player to this kid? You know, I think it was, it was funny for people to make those connections. But for me, I think it, what it came down to was finally having, like you discussed, like I've had some crazy weird things happen in my career or just didn't know any better that I shouldn't try that allowed me to, to try different things and be successful. And I got to a place where I didn't feel like I had anything left to prove. Like I found a place where fortunately, even still today, 
I'm still working just as much as I was, if not more than I was 20 years ago in different spaces and places. So it was easy to start to make music with the idea of sharing it with others. I'd say right around when I left ESPN, I'd say around 2012, 2013, that's when I finally was like really comfortable with being like, I don't, I'm not just going to, everyone knows me, knows Sal Masekela, right? As this character who presents these things that they love. I throw a lot of elements of myself into that, but that's not who I am. And the closest thing that I could do to sort of make something, actually create something that shares who I am is music. So that was, it was really easy to start making music. And my, my cousin, Sonny, whose father produces all my dad's great records. They've been best friends for 60 years. It was easy for us to, 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 to really deep dive into it and made our first record, um, 2012 called the sound of Alakazam. And that Alakazam came about because I was like, oh, there's no way I'm putting out a Sal Masekela record. No one wants to hear that. And I knew I would just be crucified from within the action sports world. Like, who does this guy think he is putting out a record? No one knows your history, right? My, Masekela backwards is Alakazam. Um, and it was a nice way to sort of hide within it. If people figured it out, cool. But because my face wasn't anywhere where they, I wanted to see if the music would actually resonate with people, you know, was I crazy or, you know, did I have something to give that people could connect with? And, uh, and they did. And it's been fun. Just finished a second album, just put out a song last week with too short, um, called Oshante. Um, you know, we've got millions of plays on Spotify and had the, been lucky enough to have my music on big shows like HBO yeah, Entourage early on and then House of Lies um, it's the new uh, theme music for the podcast <laughs> <laughs> House of Lies on, uh, on Showtime we just got a song on Shooter uh, a couple of weeks ago and just some fun things that have come from it and it's 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 so much I got to play play Bonnaroo this year you know play Bonnaroo this year we played the Afropunk Music Fest- Festival in Paris last year and um, it's just, it's a gift. It's really been a gift to be able to, to, to finally do it. And then to your, to point of your question, you know, when I put up, made my first record, I actually had to hand it to my dad and my dad was like, okay, I need to see about this, see if you're crazy or not. And then he came back to me and he's like, this is beautiful, man. Why did you wait so long? And to get that from my father who would have no problem telling me like, don't ever do this again like stay in your lane, but instead encouraged me to keep making it. And the last thing he said to me after that was, I'm just mad that I'm not on this record. So when you make your next record, make sure that you put me on it. So this last time around, I called him and I said, I said, are you really serious? And he said, yeah, man. And he flew, he flew, um, he came to LA and we worked on it and we made this beautiful song called In an Age which is, if you're on Spotify, is, is on our it's on our page on Alakazam. And we just made this beautiful song and had the most fun. And you know, to be able to come full circle with him in that manner where, you know, we, we play on a, on, a, on a song together. And it's great. It's, uh, it's a gift beyond comprehension. That's awesome. Sounds difficult to interview because I have so many questions. You're such a good storyteller. I'm just curious how you find your next story or your next song. What, what stories and songs really resonate with you? One of the fortunate things about growing up, right, and getting into your late 30s and your 40s is that you have been through some shit. And you learn that... The only things that really make you you are the things that you've had to struggle with. Um, a lot of times, I think we look at success from a from a place of the highs, but it's really the lows that drive you forward in anything in love, life, money, all of it. Look at our world right now. We are in a fucking low. This country is in the lowest of of its lows, but I. 
that's those are the places that I find the best places for storytelling is to to look at where there is struggle and what's on the other side of of these struggles and so a lot of times you know it's it could be like I said it could be love it could be what's happening you know in our in this crazy society where in America where we're having these old conversations that we're trying to like re revisit these these ideas that never worked, never could have worked, that somehow or another because they're spoken of in within some level of an intellectual twang, that you know, maybe it's a maybe it is a maybe it is a good idea if we separate ourselves by, you know, how you think or how you look. Maybe that's gonna be a better way. Like that you know, the those things, those are the places, while the fucked up is crazy and crazy, those are the things that, that I find exciting as far as opportunities for storytelling, whether it's visually or in when it comes to, to song. I, I, look, I look at struggle and struggle within my own life has been really the, the, the basis for being able to, to make any of the records that I've made so far. I'm excited to to just. Are you going to keep making more? Yeah, I'm definitely. I mean, I think we just we we signed a booking agent today. Actually, the, earlier today we congrats. We went uh, and had a really great meeting. Um, it was cool to to go and to sit with these people in a room who they send bands all around the world, and they're like, "We're looking at what you've done so far without any support," and we find that intriguing. And we think you make great music. Do you really want to do this? Because I've been doing this out of my pocket. And I've probably broken even up until now. Um, but it never was about making money. It's always just been about this. Is what, it makes me feel good. There's no better feeling I have than being on stage with my band. You know? Or making a record. Like, it's as good as I feel when I am in the backcountry at Bald Face. You know? chest deep and chucking myself off of something. It's as good as I feel stroking into, you know, a, a six footer at cloud break, hoping that it's not a closeout. It's, uh, it's, it literally is on par with that. So to be able to add that into my lifestyle and have support for it, it is, is crazy. So yes, more records. We'll be going back in the studio to start writing writing new music in the new year. I'm so stoked. You know what? What is the future of storytelling? Like digital media has definitely affected how we all tell stories. Mm-hmm. And I heard you on that Red Bull uh, podcast talk about how you just think the ultimate luxury is going to be luxury experience are going to be when we have no Wi Fi. Because I also love it when I have no Wi Fi. Like I turn off my Wi Fi Saturdays and I try to keep to it hard but i do it so what do you think the future of storytelling is i think the future of storytelling is truth i think earnest truth is going to be it seems like it's becoming more and more of almost a luxury item you have to be brave to share your truth because not everyone's going to agree with it. It might be easier for you to mask it or to spin it in a manner that might appeal to a broader audience of people because it might be more comfortable for people to take in what you have to say if you season it in a in a in a way that that they think, oh, okay, now I, I, I'm okay with this. But I think the future of storytelling is people not being afraid to just to, to share truth. Um, because I never thought that it, that it would become, I never thought it would become a shooting star. Like a, that it would be, I never thought that something like just telling the earnest truth would become as like powerful a moment as being like, oh look, a shooting star. We are in a weird time. But I think that, that to me, that's what it that that's what it is. And I and if you look at the success of 
Amazon, you look at the success of, uh, of, of, of Netflix, you look at the success of, of the types of things that are successful on HBO and the types of things that are successful on any of the quote unquote networks or platforms that are still flourishing. It is because they are sharing people's truths and they're sharing truths and telling stories in a manner where people can't help but identify because they're able to see a reflection of their life and identify with those characters and identify with the real struggles of the entire landscape of who we are as humans. We were subjected to, for a long time, to this idea that only like the beautiful among us in, in what we perceive to be like these little ranges of beauty or intelligence, um, that those are the people who are allowed to to either share or portray stories. And the rest of us will find the little pieces and nuggets that we can within them that we can find to ad- identify with them, uh, with them. Those days are over. And I think, I honestly think that's why we're in this sort of last hurrah of a certain group of people trying to say, no, 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 no. Actually, everyone needs to be this way because this is who we are. And if you can't conform to what's going on in this box, then, you know, you don't get to be, you don't, you definitely don't get to stand in the front of the line. And we don't even know if we want you in the line. And I think people are tired of that. I think people are are tired of, they don't want to be spoon fed. I think people want to chew on shit. They want to digest it. And innately we as humans, like that's what we are drawn to. It's the reason why in an era of Snapchat and Insta stories, documentary films are still the things that people will stop and drop everything to, to dive into because it's an innate thing that we need to be able to connect to, to feel each other. I think what's so cool in sports is it's not just the pretty, really good athlete getting sponsored now. It's the overweight girl doing yoga who's of a different race that you wouldn't think does yoga or the girl that's doing ultra marathons and she's also overweight. And it's so cool. I'm, I'm seeing this little yeah, revolution there's no, happening. There's no, there's no box anymore. And that's also the, that's also the great thing about everyone having a platform now. Listen, there's a certain sector of human beings that are just going to hate the shit out of themselves. They're going to hate themselves. They hate their lives. Some shitty things have happened to them. And the only thing that makes them feel good is being able to belittle others. And the only way that they can have like a sustained feeling of like feeling good is to do that. That's all they do, right? Like they, they, it, it gives them pleasure. Like that's their, it's the, it's the fucking dopamine release for them. Let's put those people to the side because they're not going to be able to be changed, right? And the internet amplifies them times 10 billion. But the most important, great, greatest gift we've been given by this connectivity is people being able to turn the camera on themselves and say, hey, this is really scary for me to do. It's hard, but this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I love. This is where my struggles are. And suddenly, someone from 100 miles, 1,000 miles, 15,000 miles, 100,000 miles away can go, oh, my God, that's me. Thank you. That was awesome. So we've come to the quick and dirty round. All right. What do you listen to when you want to get pumped up? (sighs) Kendrick. How about chill? Feist. Favorite Favorite TV series you recently binge watched? Like for me, it was Breaking Bad. I'm a little late to the game. Favorite TV series I recently binged watched? Uh, Game of Thrones. Daily morning routine when home? I wake up. I slice a lemon in half. I boil some hot water. I put all that lemon juice in there a little cayenne, and um, maybe some chaga mushroom tea. That's my 
That's my get up. I do some Wim Hof breathing. What? This is my routine. And um, then I have a little like meditation and then look out, motherfuckers. I'm ready. Then I'm then then my coffee. <laughs> I love that you do is like the all of us do Wim Hof. That's so funny. Um, any travel hacks or ways to stay sane and healthy on the road? Long distance plane flights. When I say long distance, anything over four hours, I think it's imperative that you find some sort of compression um, garments that are comfortable, that breathe well, and work for you. For me, I like to wear 2XU um, compression pants and usually a vest underneath like a light sweat, sweatpants style um, clothes. And it makes a difference in how I feel after I fly. It literally has changed the way I look at jet lag. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my, that's my trap. That's my main travel hack. Any icebreaker questions or things that you do t- when you're about to interview someone, you're a little intimidated to interview. Well, one of the things that I try to do is take some time to remind myself that I'm talking to another human being and um, to get out of my head. That's really, that's really the thing. Because if you're interviewing somebody who's remotely intimidating or is, or is well accomplished and you're in your head, they're going to know it and they're going to feast on you because it's going to be fun. So get out of your head and... My main thing that I do is I try to picture someone else. I try to talk to them like a specific person that I'm close with so that it feels familial and feels familiar so so that they're like, oh, wait a minute. Like, all right, this motherfucker's engaged with me. I I can't play games with them. Any ways to recover from something awkward that happens in an interview? Um, Laughter. Laughter is the best recovery. How about your favorite CrossFit move or my, sequence or whatever the name of it is called? My favorite CrossFit move right now is um, muscle ups because I finally have learned to string them together. What's a muscle up? Muscle up is a gymnastics uh, maneuver that you can do either on a straight bar or on the rings in which you have to get yourself from hanging up in a position where you can push up from a dip position. Um, on top of the rings or on top of the bar. I'm enjoying your Instagram videos of your, your CrossFit gym. It looks really fun. It's really fun place. Um, follow us, Deuce Gym, uh, on Instagram, D-E-U-C-E. It's fun because it's we're not your standard CrossFit gym. We're a strength and conditioning, movement, gymnastics. Like, What do you want to do to feel better to perform at life? We've been doing a little bit of Coach Summer's workout. Do you know who he is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gymnastic body. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. I follow him. It's been fun. I'm guessing I know the answer to this. Paleo, vegan, time-restricted eating. I am paleo with – I really have been enjoying playing around with intermittent fasting. Cool. Um, 14 hours isn't that long of a time, it turns out. But we're conditioned to think differently. So you're feeding for only a 10-hour window. Yeah. Okay. Generally speaking. Yeah. Probably five or six days Eight a to week. six. Something um, like that. Yeah. If you had to live, so I just listened to this really great podcast on Found My Fitness about time-restricted eating um, with Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who's a surfer and a former surf diva, by the way. Mm. So if you had to live somewhere else besides Venice Beach, where would you live? You could live anywhere in the world. Fuck. If I could live anywhere else in the world... I think I would live in South Africa. Where though? Cape Town, J- Joburg, J- J- um, Jeffrey's Bay. I really like it up there. I really like it up there. Are you regular foot? Goofy foot. Goofy foot. I'm goofy foot. Power to you. Uh, Mentalized boat trip or Tavi? Tavarua. Oh, man. That's fucking tough question. And you know what? It's a high class problem that it is a tough question because... I have a lot of experience at both. I'm going to say mm, mental white boat trip. What boat? Indies, Trader? 
Oh, well, if we're, if we're going there, four. Um, I would say that yeah, the indie, indies indies four mental wise with just my best friends, I get to curate the the whole crew. Absolutely, Rebecca Rush. She is the Wonder Woman of adventure. That's what we're calling she her. She is the she is the queen mother of badassery. All right, Rebecca, that's a better line than Wonder Woman of Adventure. So she told me to ask you, what is Cell's Lounge? And she wanted me to say it in my sexiest voice. So what is Cell's Lounge? What goes on in there? What is it? It was at a, oh, maybe I'm messing Sal, it up. It's like Sal's, Sal's Corner, World. Sal's World. Sal's World. So at all the, the um, music festivals that Rebel broadcasts here in the States, the main ones, um, Austin City Limits, Bonnaroo, and Lollapalooza, I have something called Sal's World, which is basically this really cool lounge setup. It's much like what a, a living room would be. Um, very well art directed that artists come to to sit and have conversations. But we make it we make it so that when they come in, they're just like, "Oh, what what? This is chill. I want to hang here." And uh, I get to have all these great conversations with. Uh, all sorts of different artists and bands. They're either like new bands or well established, and it's a uh, it's it's a blast. But this last year at uh, Bonnaroo, there excuse me at Austin City Limits, there was a Red Bull Athlete Summit happening. So all the athletes came to Sal's World and hung out. Rebecca was one of them. Um, so a few ladies asked me to ask you: Are you single? <laughs> I am single. I am single. I've never been divorced, and I have no children. Wow! And I'm a unicorn. I had. I was on a date recently, and the girl said to me, "She said, I have to tell you that I was a little put off by you at first." And I was like, "Why?" She said, "Well, you're you don't have any kids. You've never been married. You don't have like multiple baby mamas, and um." You're, you, 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 you seem to be enjoying life. Like you're not, it's like, what's wrong with you? And I thought it was really interesting that in 2017, something would have to be wrong with you to not have, just to, to have made different choices. I'm not saying that like my friends who have kids either out of wedlock or a divorce, like their lives are amazing. I just was always, I was always paranoid about that happening probably because I was a child of that situation. And so I never wanted to be that dad. And I think that's really why I guess I've, I've, I've just been waiting to find my partner, like a real partner, like someone who I love and we love the shit out of each other, but I want a partner. All right, Sal, I've, 20 girlfriends in San Diego <laughs> who are single. They all surf. They're into adventure. They have their shit together. They don't have kids. They've never been married, but they're not in LA. That's cool. I've um, got like five friends in LA, what, more what? in San Diego that are single. Um, I'm, I am totally 100% open. And I, lo I listen, I don't think it's hor like dating isn't horrible. I also have like a crazy life. Like I travel like a crazy person. D going out with me. You got to you got to really be secure with yourself. Oh my gosh, I have so many girlfriends who travel because they're filmers or anyways, we're going to have to hang out. Okay. I have match made four people including two women together. All Pretty right. Epic. So, um, what advice would you give to 15-year-old Sal if you could go back in time? What advice would I give to 15-year-old Sal? I would say to 15 year old Sal, I would say, don't waste so much time trying to fit in. Like, you don't, you don't need to fit in. Just do you, everything will be fine. I love that. If you could fly, we ask this question to everybody. If you could fly an eco-friendly plane around the world, what would that message to the world be? If it could have a banner that kind of advertise something, like those, those ones that come over Solana Beach and it says cheetahs. Which is mm. not a positive message. It's just advertising a place called Cheetahs. I would say when you're dead, the only thing they're going to remember is how you made people feel. I love that. Sal, where can we find more of you and your music? 
Um, well, Alakazam is available on Spotify and iTunes and SoundCloud. Um, our new song, Oshante, just went up. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter mostly as Sal Masakella. Um, I do have a Facebook page, but I, I don't do too much with it. I find Facebook to be probably the most toxic place on earth. So I, I use it to check in on friends, but I pretty much have given up like scrolling through the, the timelines because it's fucking disturbing. And <laughs> people either are like oversharing shit about their lives that just save that shit for your house, A, or B, like conspiracy theorizing based off of information that is like not vetted at all but might speak to like some shit that they hope might be right. And then they're going to be willing to like fight you over it on the fucking internet. So I really don't fuck around with Facebook too much. Um, But you're on Instagram. But I am on Instagram and I'm loads of fun on the gram. So hit me up. Sal Masakela. Awesome, Sal. Thank you so much. Wait, Kelly's wave pool. Have you gone? I am going. All right. I can't wait to hear it more. So the next time you talk, we talk, you will definitely be getting a play-by-play. Or you would have seen me be grossly successful or not successful riding it. Thank you so much for sharing your wild ideas with me. And Thank you audience. so much for um, awesome. taking the time and asking such great questions. I hope I, for your audience, I hope that I didn't talk too much or sound full of myself. I'm just trying to figure it out. The one piece of advice that I can say that I will leave your audience with is the second you realize that you are never going to have it all figured out is when life gets to be really fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening to this show. Thank you to Sal for your awesome, inspiring stories. Thanks to his agent, Cole, and to Charlie Rosine at Red Bull for hooking me up with this interview. And thank you to our sponsors, Olukai and Active Skin Repair. For more on Sal and his music, as well as his latest single, we'll have links even to the nonprofit he's involved in, some more of his videos on Wild Ideas worthliving.com. On the website, you can also contact me. Send me your feedback right now. What do you want more of? What do you want less of? What could be improved for next year? We're ramping up to make this the best show for you ever next year. Thank you again for listening to this show. If you're listening over Thanksgiving, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. I'm so grateful to you. This has been an incredible year. We have some great guests coming up. Olympian Kelly Clark, swimmer Diana Nyad, a few incredible health experts, and more for the final shows. We'll see you next week. Enjoy your holiday. Enjoy your holiday.